This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman phoning the secretary of a cycling club to find out about becoming a member. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, South City Cycling Club. Oh, hi. Um, I want to find out about joining the club. Right, I can help you there. I'm the club secretary and my name's Jim Hunter. Oh, hi, Jim. So, are you interested in membership for yourself? That's right. OK, well, there are basically two types of adult membership. If you're pretty serious about cycling, there's the full membership. That costs $260 and that covers you not just for ordinary cycling, but also for races, both here in the city and also in other parts of Australia. Right. Well, I'm not really up to that standard. I was more interested in just joining a group to do some cycling in my free time. Sure. That's why most people join. So in that case, you'd be better with the recreational membership. That's $108 if you're over 19 and $95 if you're under. I'm 25. OK. It's paid quarterly and you can upgrade it later to the full membership if you want to, of course. Now, both types of membership include the club fee of $20. They also provide insurance in case you have an accident Though we hope you won't need that, of course. No. OK. Well, I'll go with the recreational membership, I think. And that allows me to join in the club activities and so on? That's right. And once you're a member of the club, you're also permitted to wear our kit when you're out cycling. It's green and white. Yes, I've seen cyclists wearing it. So can I buy that at the club? And uh, no, it's made to order by a company in Brisbane. You can find them online. They're called Jerry's. That's J E R R I Z. You can use your membership number to put in an order on their website. OK. Now, can you tell me a bit about the rides I can do? Sure. So we have training rides pretty well every morning and they're a really good way of improving your cycling skills as well as your general level of fitness. But they're different levels. Level A is pretty fast. You're looking at about 30 or 35 kilometres an hour. If you can do about 25 kilometres an hour, you'd probably be level B and then level C are the novices who stay at about 15 kilometres per hour. Right. Well, I reckon I'd be level B. 
So when are the sessions for that level? Uh, there are a couple each week. They're both early morning sessions. There's one on Tuesdays, and for that one you meet at 5.30am, and the meeting point's the stadium. Do you know where that is? Yes, it's quite near my home, in fact. OK, and how about the other one? That's on Thursdays. It starts at the same time, but they meet at the main gate to the park. Is that the one just past the shopping mall? That's it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So how long are the rides? Uh, they're about an hour and a half, so if you have a job, it's easy to fit in before you go to work. And the members often go somewhere for coffee afterwards, so it's quite a social event. OK, that sounds good. I've only just moved to the city, so I don't actually know many people yet. Well, it's a great way to meet people. And does each ride have a leader? Sometimes, but not always. But you don't really need one. The group members on the ride support one another anyway. How would we know where to go? If you check the club website, you'll see that the route for each ride is clearly marked. So you can just print that out and take it along with you. It's similar from one week to another, but it's not always exactly the same. And what do I need to bring? Hmm, well, bring a bottle of water and your phone. You shouldn't use it while you're cycling, but have it with you. Right. And in winter, it's well before sunrise when we set out, so you need to make sure your bike's got lights. That's OK. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd definitely like to join. So what's the best way of going about it? Ah, uh, you can... That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a talk about the 11th Annual Durham County Car Exhibition. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Ladies and gentlemen of Durham, start your engines. 
Skip Gordon here, inviting you to the 11th annual Durham County Car Exhibition. That's right, it's that time of year again. Mark your calendars. The pre-opening event kicks off on the 18th, and the exhibition officially opens to the public on Saturday, March the 19th. Take it from me, you won't want to miss Durham's most attended public event of the year five times running. You don't have to be a motorhead to appreciate the finest cars, both new and old, in existence today, but it helps. Be one of the 70,000 people to see everything from big rigged monster trucks to good old-fashioned classic hot rods. Get your tickets now. Admission is £10 for adults and £5 for children during off-peak times, and £20 for adults and £10 for children and senior citizens on weekends and for full day passes. Come see vintage classics, bid in the auctions, and even test out a few on the winner's circle racetrack. An insider tip, weekends are the exact time when all of the best attractions take place, but to avoid Saturday crowds, join us this Sunday. You'll see me, Skip Gordon and all your friends from WKXP there this Sunday at our very own booth. So stop by and say hi, and you might just win a prize of your own. A new attraction this year will be the addition of a new car category. Electricity, namely the electric car class. See displays from Toyota, Honda, and you guessed it, Tesla. Watch as the first generation of fully electric cars compete on style, ride, and watch the main entertainment as there's going to be a fabulous show of racing car to see who takes home fastest battery powered car. While not typically known for their speed, this new class is guaranteed to surprise you. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Get tickets before they sell out. Last year's tickets sold out fast, so we upped the attendance this year. That's right, more seats. But don't wait. Act now and save. That's right, if you buy your tickets before this Friday, you'll get two for the price of one. That's right, two for the price of one. And don't worry, kids. Just like last year, there's something specially for you. Wreak havoc on the road with the kids' crazy cars ride, and then race around the tiny tykes track in your favourite child-sized race car. Meanwhile, mum and dad can take a spin in a ride a bit more than their size. We're rolling out a massive dirt track so you can get behind the wheel and test drive something a little more adventurous. Put the pedal to the metal in a 4x4 SUV as you go over bumps and navigate through twists and turns, you'll want to buckle up. You heard it here. Act now to get in on the fun at the Durham County Car Show before it's too late. Come for prizes, good prices, and good old-fashioned family fun. We had a lucky draw for a new car last year, but this year our main event is the Monster Truck Rally where one lucky fan will win a chance experience the thrill from behind the wheel, well, next to the wheel, as they ride with legendary driver Smash Tate, feel the speed firsthand, and talk to a living legend in a true, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. For tickets, go online to www.durhamcountycars.com or call one triple eight car show now We'll see you there, and always remember to buckle up. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear a student called Joanna talking to her new supervisor about some research she has done on psychology and music. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi Joanna, good to meet you. Now, before we discuss your new research project, I'd like to hear something about the psychology study you did last year for your master's degree. So, how did you choose your subjects for that? Well, I had six subjects all professional musicians and all female. Three were violinists and there was also a cello player and a pianist and a flute player. They were all very highly regarded in the music world and they'd done quite extensive tours in different continents and quite a few had won prizes and competitions as well. Mm. And they were quite young, weren't they? Yes, between 25 and 29. Um, the mean was 27.8. I wasn't specifically looking for artists who'd produced recordings, but this is something that's just taken for granted these days, and they all had. Right. Now, you collected your data through telephone interviews, didn't you? Yes. I realised if I was going to interview leading musicians, it'd only be possible over the phone because they're so busy. I recorded them using a telephone recording adapter. I'd been worried about the quality, but it worked out all right. I managed at least a 30-minute interview with each subject, sometimes longer. Did doing it on the phone make it more stressful? I'd thought it might. Um, it was all quite informal, though, and in fact they seemed very keen to talk. And... I don't think using the phone meant I got less rich data. Rather the opposite, in fact. Interesting. And you were looking at how performers dress for concert performances. That's right. Uh, my research investigated the way players see their role as a musician and how this is linked to the type of clothing they decide to wear. But that focus didn't emerge immediately when I started, I was more interested in trying to investigate the impact of what was worn on those listening, and also whether someone like a violinist might adopt a different style of clothing from, say, someone playing the flute or the trumpet. Hmm. It's interesting that the choice of dress is up to the individual, isn't it? Yes. You'd expect there to be rules about it in orchestras, but that's quite rare. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. You only had women performers in your study. Mm -hmm. Was that because male musicians are less worried about fashion? I think a lot of the men are very much influenced by fashion, but in social terms the choices they have are more limited. They'd really upset audiences if they strayed away from quite narrow boundaries. Mm. Now, popular music has quite different expectations. Uh, 
Did you read Mike Frost's article about the dress of women performers in popular music? No. Well, he points out that a lot of female singers and musicians in popular music tend to dress down in performances and wear less feminine clothes, um, like jeans instead of skirts. Uh, and he suggests this is because otherwise they'd just be discounted as trivial. But you could argue they're just wearing what's practical. I mean, a pop music concert is usually a pretty energetic affair. Yes, he doesn't make that point, but I think you're probably right. I was interested by the effect of the audience at a musical performance when it came to the choice of dress. The subject I interviewed felt this was really important. Mm. It's all to do with what we understand by performance as a public event. They believed the audience had certain expectations and it was up to them as performers to fulfil these expectations, to show a kind of esteem. They weren't afraid of looking as if they'd made an effort to look good. Mm. I think in the past, the audience would have had those expectations of one another too, but that's not really the case now. Not in the UK, anyway. No. And I also got interested in what sports scientists are doing too with regard to clothing. Musicians are quite vulnerable physically, aren't they? Because the movements they carry out are very intensive and repetitive. Mm. So I'd imagine some features of sports clothing could safeguard the players from the potentially dangerous effects of this sort of thing. Yes, but musicians don't really consider it. They avoid clothing that obviously restricts their movements, but that's as far as they go. Anyway, coming back to your own research, do you have any idea where you're going from here? I was thinking of doing a study using an audience, including... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about the role of sleep in humans and animals. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the role of sleep in humans and animals. Of all the biological processes in the animal kingdom, sleep is perhaps the most important. A human can survive for almost two weeks without eating. But did you know that one week without sleep can be fatal? It's even worse for animals especially for those who must avoid predators. Without sleep, an animal is much less capable of avoiding an attack. This is the case for all animals, whether they are reptiles, mammals or fish. Let us look now at how different animals sleep, reasons for their ways of rest, and the potential problems they might encounter. In marine life, sleep must be balanced with breathing. For example, the dolphin must float to the surface as it sleeps in order to breathe. Like other large sea mammals, they keep one eye open and one half of the brain awake at all times to maintain some amount of consciousness required to breathe and to watch out for possible threats. 
they sleep with only one brain hemisphere in slow wave sleep. Birds also have unusual sleeping patterns, mostly due to being constantly on edge in the presence of numerous predators. They usually sleep quite lightly. For example, Swainson's thrush, also called olive-backed thrush, is a medium-sized thrush that takes hundreds of naps during the day, each of which lasts just a few seconds. While migrating, migratory birds tend to function well on micro-naps. Horses, on the other hand, do most of their sleeping standing up. Scientists think that horses developed their habit of sleeping upright as a defense mechanism, a way of protecting themselves against predators, and a standing position keeps a horse in a constant state of readiness to race away if danger should approach. Also, horses do occasionally take short naps lying down. Horses are heavy animals with big muscles, but their bones are surprisingly delicate, so lying in one position for a long time could well injure a horse. Just like humans, animals can also have sleeping problems. Dr. John Hendricks and Adrian Morrison from the School of Veterinary Medicine, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, determined that certain diseases were primarily associated with the sleep states in animals. In their research, they emphasized that because so much in this area still remains unclear, animal models were very important for studies of sleep disorders. The physiology of sleep in animals is similar to that of humans. But why do we humans sleep? Researchers and scientists believe it helps us organize our memories of the day, that sleep acts as a kind of filing system for the brain. Without it, our thoughts become disorderly and confused, which leads to increased likelihood of accidents and a tendency to say and do bizarre things. Researchers also believe that sleep plays a key role in learning. We sleep so that the brain can integrate new knowledge and form new associations. Because of the similar sleeping pattern to that of humans, rats are often studied in order to increase our knowledge of human physiology. In one study, rats were kept awake for almost two weeks and their behavior was observed. Researchers found the sleep-deprived rats could hardly remember anything of what they had been taught that day. For example, one rat had been taught to recognize pictures of various Parisian landmarks in order to receive food. Pressing a button below a picture of the Louvre would result in food being released and so forth. However, when deprived of sleep, they would press buttons seemingly at random. In addition to rats, the fruit fly a small insect that feeds and breeds on spoiled fruit also has been used as a model organism and thousands of scientists around the world work on it. But why was the fruit fly chosen to be studied? It was for practical reasons. The most important one is that the relationship between fly and human genes is so close that the sequences of newly discovered human genes, including genes that show a susceptibility, can often be matched against their fly counterparts. This provides an indication of the function of the human gene and could help in the development of effective drugs to help people with sleeping disorders. Therefore, many scientists today choose to study the genetic structure of the fruit fly, which could make a particularly important contribution to the understanding of developmental processes in humans. In conclusion, sleep is a necessary part of life, not just for humans, but for the entire animal kingdom. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.